Section One of the Day Before Yesterday. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Day Before Yesterday by Richard Middleton. Section One An Enchanted Place. When elder brothers insisted on their rights with undue harshness, or when the grown-up people descended from Olympus with a tiresome tale of broken furniture and torn clothes, the groundlings of the schoolroom went into retreat. In summertime this was an easy matter. Once fairly escaped into the garden, any climbable tree or shady shrub provided us with a hermitage. There was a hollow tree stump full of exciting insects and pleasant earthy smells that never failed us, or, for wet days, the tool-shed with its armory of weapons with which, in imagination, we would repel the attacks of hostile forces. But in the game that was our childhood the garden was out of bounds in winter-time, and we had to seek other lairs. Behind the schoolroom piano there was a three-cornered refuge that served very well for momentary sulks or sudden alarms. It was possible to lie in ambush there, at peace with our grievances until life took a turn for the better and tempted us forth again into the active world. But when the hour was tragic, and we felt the need for a hiding place more remote, we took our troubles, not without a recurring thrill, to that enchanted place which our elders contemptuously called the Mouse Cupboard. This was a low cupboard that ran the whole length of the big attic under the slope of the roof, and here the aggrieved spirit of childhood could find solitude and darkness in which to scheme deeds of revenge, and actions of a wonderful magnanimity turn by turn. Luckily our shelter did not appeal to the utilitarian minds of the grown-up folk, or to those members of the younger generation who were beginning to trouble about their clothes. You had to enter it on your hands and knees. It was dusty, and the mice obstinately disputed our possession. On the inner walls the plaster seemed to be oozing between the rough laths, and through the little chinks and crannies in the tiles overhead our eyes could see the sky. But our imaginations soon altered these trivial blemishes. As a cave the mouse cupboard had a very interesting history. As soon as the smugglers had left it, it passed successively through the hands of Aladdin, Robinson Crusoe, Ben Gunn, and Tom Sawyer, and gave satisfaction to them all. And it would no doubt have had many other tenants if someone had not discovered that it was like the cabin of a ship. From that hour its position in our world was assured. For sooner or later our dreams always returned to the sea. Not, be it said, to the polite and civilized sea of the summer holidays, but to that sea on whose foam there open magic casements, and by whose crimson tide the ships of Captain Avery and Captain Bartholomew Roberts keep faithful tryst with the flying Dutchman. It needed no very solid vessel to carry our hearts to those enchanted waters. A paper boat floating in a saucer served well enough if the wind was propitious, so the fact that our cabin lacked portholes and was of an unusual shape did not trouble us. We could hear the water bubbling against the ship's side in a neighboring cistern, and often enough the wind moaned and whistled overhead. We had our lockers, our sleeping berths, and our cabin table, and at one end of the cabin was hung a rusty old cutlass full of notches. We would have hated any one who had sought to disturb our illusion that these notches had been made in battle. When we were stowaways even the mice were of service to us, for we gave them a full roving commission as savage rats and trembled when we heard them scampering among the cargo. But though we cut the figure of an old admiral out of a Christmas number and chased slavers with Kingston very happily for a while, the vessel did not really come into her own until we turned pirates and hoisted the Jolly Roger off the coast of Malabar. Then, by the light of guttering candles, the mice witnessed some strange sights. If any of us had any money we would carouse terribly, drinking ginger beer like water and afterwards water out of the ginger beer bottles, which still retained a faint magic. Jam has been eaten without bread on board the Black Margaret, and when we fell across a merchantman laden with a valuable consignment of dried apple rings, tough fare but interesting, and the savory sugar out of candied peel, there were boisterous times in her dim cabin. We would sing what we imagined to be sea shanties in a doleful voice and prepare our boarding pikes for the next adventure though we had no clear idea what they really were. And when we grew weary of draining rum kegs and counting the pieces of eight, our life at sea knew quieter though no less enjoyable hours. 
It was pleasant to lie still after the fever of battle, and watch the flickering candles with drowsy eyes. Surely the last word has not been said on the charm of candlelight. We liked little candles, dumpy sixteens they were perhaps, and as we lay they would spread among us their attendant shadows. Beneath us the water chuckled restlessly, and sometimes we heard the feet of the watch on deck overhead, and now and again the clanging of the great bell. In such an hour it was not difficult to picture the luminous tropic seas through which the black Margaret was making her way. The skies of irradiant stars, the desert islands like baskets of glowing flowers, and the thousand marvels of the enchanted ocean we saw them one and all. It was strange to leave this place of shadows and silences and hour-long dreams to play a humble part in a noisy, gas-lit world that had not known these wonders. But there were consolations. Elder brothers might prevail in argument by methods that seemed unfair but beneath a baffled exterior we could conceal a sublime pity for their unadventurous lives. Governesses might criticize our dusty clothes with wearisome eloquence, but the recollections that women were not allowed on board the Black Margaret helped us to remain conventionally polite. Like the gentleman in Mr. Wells' story, we knew that there were better dreams, and the knowledge raised us for a while above the trivial passions of our environment. We were not the only children who had found the mouse cupboard a place of enchantment for when we explored it first we discovered a handful of wooden beads carefully hidden in a cranny in the wall. These breathed of the nursery rather than of the schoolroom, and yet, perhaps, those forgotten children had known what we knew, and our songs of the sea stirred only familiar echoes. It is likely enough that today other children have inherited our dreams, and that other hands steer the black Margaret under approving stars. If this indeed be so, they are in our debt for in one of our hiding-places we left the Count of Monte Cristo in English, rare treasure trove for any proper boy. If this should ever meet his eyes, he will understand. End of section 1. Recording by Philip Gould. Section number 2 of The Day Before Yesterday. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Simona Russo. A Railway Journey I suppose that when little boys made their journeys by coach with David Copperfield or Tom Brown and his pea-shooting comrades, they did in truth find adventure easier to achieve than we, who were born in an age of railways. But though the rare joys of far travel by road were denied us, he did not need Mr. Rudyard Kipling, in a didactic mood, to convince us that there was plenty of romance in railway journeys, if you approached them in the right spirit. We were as fond of playing at trains as most small boys, and a stationary engine with the light of the furnace glowing on the grim face of the driver was a disquieting feature of all my nightmares. So when the grown-up people announced that one of us was to make a long journey, young Ulysses became for the moment an envied and enchanted figure. Our periodical excursions to London were well enough in their way. Noisy, jolly parties in reserved carriages to pantomimes and the Lord Mayor's show, or matter-of-fact visits to the dentist or the shops. But we all knew the features of the landscape on the way to London by heart and it was the thought of voyaging through the unknown that fired our lively blood our hazy sense of geography enabling us to believe that all manner of marvels were to be seen by young eyes from english railway carriages also we did not feel that we were real travellers until we had left all our own grown-ups behind though in such circumstances we had to put up with the indignity of being confided to the care of the guard until children have votes they will continue to suffer from such slights as this one morning in early spring i left london for the north the adult who saw me off performed his task on the whole very well true he introduced me to the guard a bearded and sinister man but on the other hand he realized the importance of my having a corner seat and only once or twice committed the error of treating me as if i were a parcel for my part, 
I was at pains to conceal my excitement beneath the mannerisms of an experienced traveller. I put the window up and down several times, and read aloud all the notices concerning luncheon baskets and danger signals. Then my companion shook hands with me in a sensible, manly fashion, and the train started. I sat back and examined my fellow travellers, and found them rather disappointing. There were three ladies, manifestly of the aunt kind, and a stiff, well-behaved little girl who might have stepped out of one of my sister's story-books. She was reading a book without pictures, and when I turned over the pages of my magazines, she displayed no interest in them whatever. I could never read in the train, so with a tentative effort at good manners, I pushed them towards her, but she shook her head. To show her that I did not think this was a snub, I pulled out my packet of sandwiches and had my lunch. After that I played with a blind, which worked with a spring, until one of the aunts told me not to fidget, although she was no aunt of mine. Then I looked out of the window, a prey to voiceless wrath. By now we had left London far behind, and when I had finished composing imaginary retorts to the unscrupulous aunt, I was quite content to see the wonders of the world flit by. There were hills and valleys decked with romantic woods and set with fascinating and secretive ponds. To my eyes, the hills were mountains, and the valleys perilous hollows, the accustomed lairs of tremendous dragons. I saw little thatched houses wherein swart witches awaited the coming of Hansel and Gretel, and fairy children waved to me from cottage gardens and the gates of level crossings, greetings which I dutifully returned until the aunt made me pull up the window. After a while a change came over the scenery. The placid greens and browns of the countryside blossomed to gold and purple and crimson. I saw a rock float across the arching sky on the sluggish wings, and my eyes were delighted with visions of deserts and mosques and palm trees. That my fellow passengers would not raise their heads to behold these marvels did not trouble me. I beat on the window with delight, until, like little Billy in Thackeray's ballad, I saw Jerusalem and Madagascar and North and South America. Then something surprising happened. I saw the earth leap up and invade the sky, and the sky drop down and blot out the earth, and I felt as though my wings were broken. Then the sides of the carriage closed in and squeezed out the door like a peep out of an orange until there was only a three-cornered gap left. The air was full of dust, and I sneezed again and again, but could not find my pocket handkerchief. Presently a young man came and lifted me out through the hole and seemed very surprised that I was not hurt. I realized that there had been an accident, for the train was broken into pieces and the permanent way was very untidy. Close at hand I saw the little girl sitting on a bank and the man kneeling at her feet, taking her boots off. I would have liked to speak to her, but I remembered how she had refused the offer of my magazines and was afraid she would snub me again. The place was very noisy, for the people were calling out and there was a great sound of steam. I noticed that everybody's face was very white, especially the guards, which made his beard seem as black as soot. The young man took me by the hand and led me along the uneven ground, and there was so much to see that my feet kept stumbling over things, and he had to hold me up. On the way we passed the body of a man lying with a rug over his head. I knew that he was dead, but I had seen drunken men in the streets lie like that, and I could not help looking about for the policeman. Soon we came to a little station, and the platform was crowded with people who would not stand still, but walked round and round making noises. When I climbed up on the platform, a woman caught hold of me and cried over me. One of her tears fell on my ear and tickled me, but she held me so tightly that I could not put up my hand to rub it. Her breath was hot on my head. Then I heard a detested voice say, Poor little boy, so tired, and I shattered back into consciousness of the world that was least interesting of all the worlds I knew.
I need not have opened my eyes to be sure that the aunts were at their fell work again, and that the little girl's snub nose was tilted to a patronizing angle. Had I wakened a minute later, she, too, would have joined in the auntish chorus of compassion for my weakness. As it was, I looked at her with drowsy pity, finding that she was one of those luckless infants who might as well stay at home for all the fun they get out of travelling. She knew no better than to scream when the train ran into a tunnel. What would she have done if she had seen my rock? The train ran on and on, and still I throned it in my corner, awake or dreaming, indisputably master of all the things that counted. The three aunts faded into antimacassars. The little girl endured her uninteresting life and became an aunt and an antimacassar in her turn. And still I swung my legs in my corner seat, a boy errant in the strange places of the world. I do not remember the name of the station at which the bearded guard ultimately brought me out of my dreams. I do remember standing stiffly on the platform and deciding that I had been travelling night and day for three hundred years. When I communicated this fact to the relatives who met me, they were strangely unimpressed. But I knew that when I returned home to my brothers, they would display a decent interest in the story of my wanderings. After all, you can't expect grown-up people to understand everything. End of section 2「Section 3 of the Day Before Yesterday」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Vincenzo Vipond The Day Before Yesterday by Richard Middleton The Magic Pool Being born in a skeptical age, heirs of a world that certainly took its Darwin too seriously, we children did not readily enlarge the circle of our supernatural acquaintances. There was the old witch, who lived in the two-storied house beyond the hill, in whom less discriminate eyes recognized only the very respectable widow of an officer in the India army. There was the ghost of the murdered shepherd lad that haunted the ruined hut high up on the windy downs. On gusty nights we heard him piping shrilly to his phantom flocks and sometimes their little bells seemed to greet us from the chorus of the storm. There was a little drowned kitten, who mewed to us from the shadows of the rainwater cistern, and a small boy who cried about the garden in the autumn because he could not find his ball among the dead leaves. We had all heard the three last, and most of us had seen them at twilight time, when ghosts pluck up their poor thin courage and take their walks abroad. As for the witch, we relied on our intuitions and gave her house a wide berth. The credentials of these four unquiet spirits, having been examined and found satisfactory, schoolroom opinion was against any addition to their number. We would not accept my younger brother's murderer carrying a sack, or my little sister's procession of special tortoises, though we acknowledged that there was merit in them, regarded merely as artistic conceptions. Perhaps, subconsciously, we realized that to make the supernatural commonplace is also to make it ineffective, and that there is no dignity in a life jostled by spooks. At all events, we relied for our periodical panics on those which had received the official sanction, and on the terrifying monsters our imaginations had drawn from real-life burglars, lunatics, and drunken men. It was therefore noteworthy that as soon as we discovered the pool in Hayward's Wood, we were all agreed that it was no ordinary sheet of water, but one of those enchanted pools which draw their waters from magic sources and are capable of throwing spells over mortals who approach them unwarily. And yet, though we felt instinctively that there was something queer about it, the pool in itself was not unattractive. Held, as it were, in a cup in the heart of the wood, it still contrived to win its share of sunshine through the branches above. On its surface the water boatmen were ferrying cheerfully to and fro, while overhead the dragonflies drove their gaudy monoplanes in ceaseless competition. 
All about the woods were gay with wild garlic and the little purple gloves that nature provides for foxes, and through a natural alley we could see a golden meadow, where cups of cool butter were spread with lavish generosity to quench the parched tongues of bees. The mud that squelched under our feet as we stood on the brink seemed to be good, honest mud, and gave our boots the proper holiday finish. Nevertheless, we stared silently at the waters, half expecting to see them thicken and part in brown foam, to allow some red-mouthed prehistoric monster to rise oozily from its resting place in the mud, some such mammoth as we had seen carved in stone on the borders of the lake at the Crystal Palace. But no monster appeared. Only a rabbit sprang up suddenly on the far side of the pool, and seeing we had no gun and no dog, limped off in a leisurely manner to the warren. After a while, we grew weary of our doubts, and tacitly agreeing to pretend that it was only an ordinary pond, fell to paddling in the shallows with a good heart. The mud slid warmly through our toes, and the water lay round our calves like a tight string. But we were not changed, as we had half anticipated, into tadpoles or water lilies. It was apparent that the magic was of a subtler kind than this and we splashed about cheerfully until the inevitable happened and one of us went in up to his waist. Then we sat on the bank, nursing our wet feet and laughing at the victim as he ruefully run out his clothes. We were all of a nautical turn of mind, and we agreed that the pond would serve very well for minor naval engagements, though it was too sheltered to provide enough wind for sailing ships. Still, here we should at all events be secure from such a disaster as had recently overtaken my troop ship Dauntless, which was cruising in calm weather on Pickhurst Pond when all of a sudden a land breeze shook the shrouds and she was overset. And four and twenty good soldiers sank to the bottom like lead, which they were. Regarded merely as an attractive piece of water, the pool could not fail to be of service in our adventurous lives. But all the time we felt in our hearts that it was something more, though we would have found it hard to give reasons for our conviction, for the pool seemed very well able to keep the secret of its enchantment. We did not even know whether it was the instrument of black magic or of white, whether its influence on human beings was amiable or malevolent. We only knew that it was under a spell, that beneath its reticent surface, that showed nothing more than the reflection of our own inquiring faces, lay hidden some part of that especial magic that makes the dreams of young people as real as life, and contradicts the unlovely generalizations of disillusioned adults. All that was necessary was to find the key that would unlock the golden gates. The brother who was nearest to me in terms of years found it two days later, and came to me breathlessly with the news. He had been reading a book of fairy tales, and had come upon the description of just such a magic pool as ours, even to the rabbit who was, it seemed, a kind of advance agent to the spirit of the pool. The rules were very clear. All you had to do was go to the pool at midnight and wish aloud, and your wish would be granted. If you were greedy enough to wish more than once, you would be changed into a goldfish. My brother thought it would be rather jolly to be a goldfish, and so for a while did I. But on reflection we decided that if the one wish were carefully expended, it might be more amusing to remain a boy. It says something for our spirit of adventure that we did not even discuss the advisability of undertaking this lawless expedition. We were more engaged in rejoicing and anticipation over the discomfiture of our elder brothers and settling the difficult problem of what we should wish. My brother was all for seven-league boots, and invisible caps, and other conjuring tricks of a fairy character. I had set my heart on money, more sovereigns than we could carry, and I finally brought my brother round to my point of view. After all, he could always buy the other things if he had enough money. It was agreed that he should wind up his birthday watch, and that we should only pretend to go to bed, as we should have to start at half-past eleven. When planned by daylight, the whole thing seemed absurdly easy. We had no difficulty in getting out of the house when the time came, simply because this was not the sort of thing that the grown-up people expected us to do. But we found the world strangely altered. The familiar lanes had become rivers of changing shadows, the hedgerows were ambuscades of robbers, the tall trees were affronted giants. 
Fortunately, we were on very good terms with the moon at the time, so when she made her periodical appearances from behind the scudding clouds, she came as a friend. Nevertheless, when my hand accidentally touched my brother's in the dark, it stayed there, and we were glad to walk along hand in hand, a situation which we would have thought deplorable for two fellows of our years by day. It seemed to me that my brother was breathing shortly and noisily, as if he were excited, but presently the surprising thought came to me that it might be my own breathing that I heard. As we drew near to Hayward's wood, the moon retired behind a cloud and stayed there. This was hardly friendly of her, for the wood was terribly dark, and the noise of our own stumblings made us pause in alarm again and again. When we stood still and listened, all the trees seemed to be saying, Hush! Somehow we reached the pool at last, and stayed our steps on the bank expectantly. At first we could see nothing but shadows, but, after a while, we discovered that it was full of drowned stars, a little pale as though the water had extinguished some of their fire. And then, as we wondered at this, the moon shone through the branches overhead and lit the wood with a cool and mysterious radiance that reminded me oddly of the transformation scene in our last pantomime. My brother pulled his watch out of his pocket, but his hand shook so that he could hardly tell the time. Five minutes more, he whispered hoarsely. I tried to answer him, and found that I could not speak. And then, as we waited breathlessly, we heard a noise among the undergrowth on the other side of the pool, a noise, it seemed, of footsteps, that grew louder and louder in our excited ears, till it was as if all the armies of the world were tramping through the wood, and then, and then... When we stopped to get our breath halfway home, we first discovered that neither of us had had presence of mind enough to wish. But we knew that there was no going back. We had had our chance, and missed it. But, even now, I do not doubt that it was a magic pool. End of section 3、section、four of the Day Before Yesterday Day This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Day Before Yesterday by Richard Middleton. The Storyteller. He changed with the seasons, and like the seasons was welcome in every mood. In spring he was forlorn and passionate in turn, now fiercely eloquent. Now tuneful with those little cheerful songs that seem, in terms of human emotion, to be the saddest of all. In summer he dreamed in sensuous and unambitious idleness, gladly conscious of the sunshine and warm winds and flower smells, and using only languorous and gentle words. In autumn, with the dead leaves of the world about his feet, he became strangely hopeful and generous of glad promises of adventure and conquest. It seemed as though he found it easier to triumph when nature had abdicated her jealous throne. But it was in the winter time when he came into his own kingdom and mastered his environment and his passions to make the most joyful songs. Then he would lie at full length on the hearthrug, and we children, sitting in a rapt circle, fantastically lit by the fire, would listen to his stories and know that they were the authentic wisdom. It was in vain that the grown ups warned us against the fascinations of his society, telling us that dreamers came to no good end in a practical world. As well might the townfolk of Hamlin and Brunswick have ordered their children to turn a deaf ear to the tune of the Pied Piper. We had studied life from a practical point of view between our games and found it unsatisfying. This man brought us something infinitely more desirable. He would come stepping with delicate feet. Fearful of trampling on our own tender dreams, and he would tell us the enchanted stories that we had not heard since we were born. He told us the meaning of the stars and the significance of the sun and moon, and listening to him, we remembered that we had known it all once before in another place. Sometimes, even, we would remind him of some trivial incident that he had forgotten, and then he would look at us oddly and murmur sadly that he was getting very old. When the stories were over and all the room was still ringing with beautiful echoes, he would stand erect and ask us fiercely whether we saw any straws in his hair. 
we would climb up him to look, for he was very tall, and when we told him that we could not find any, he would say, The day you see them there will be no more stories. We knew what the stories were worth to us, so we were always afraid of looking at his head for fear that we should see the straws, and all our gladdest hours should be finished. His voice was all the music extant, and it was only by recalling it that our young ears could find that there was beauty in fine singing and melodiousness in the chant of birds. Yet when his words were eloquent, we forgot the voice and the speaker, content to sacrifice our critical individualities to his inspiration, till we were no more than dim and silent figures in the background of his tale. It was only in winter time that he achieved this supreme illusion. Perhaps the firelight helped him, and the chill shadows of the world. In the summer his stories had the witchery of dreams. Their realism startled us, yet we knew that they were not real. After listening to them through a hot afternoon, we would stretch back into consciousness as though we had been asleep. His drowsy fancies lulled our personalities, but did not conquer them. The winter magic was of a rarer kind. Then even his silences became significant for he brought us to so close an intimacy with his mind that his very thoughts seemed like words. It is idle to expect a child to believe that every grown-up person was a child once upon a time, for it is not credible that they could have forgotten so much. But this man was a child both in feeling and in understanding. He knew the incidents that perplexed us in those nursery legends that have become classics, and sometimes it was his pleasure to tell them to us again, having regard to our wakeful sympathies. He was the friend of all the poor lost creatures of romance, the giants whose humiliating lot it was to be defeated by any stripling lad, the dragons whose flaming strength was a derision when opposed to virtue and armor. He shared our pity for Antaeus and Caliban and Goliath of Gath, and even treated sorcerers and wicked kings with reasonable humanity. Somehow, though we felt that it was wicked, we could not help being sorry for people when they were punished very severely. The very ease with which giants could be outwitted suggested that the great simple fellows might prove amiable enough if they were kindly treated, while it was always possible that dragons might turn out to be bewitched princes if only the beautiful princesses would kiss them, instead of sending heroes to kill them unfairly, without giving them an opportunity of explaining their motives. Our storyteller understood our scruples and sympathized with them, and in his versions everyone had a chance, whether they were heroes or no. Even the best children are sometimes cruel, but they are never half so pitiless as the writers of fairy stories. But better than any fairy stories were the stories that he told us of our own lives, which under his touch became the wonderful adventures which they really were. He showed us that it was marvelous to get out of bed in the morning and marvelous to get into bed at night. He made us realize the imaginative value of common things, and the fun that could be derived even from the performance of duties by aid of little make-believe. The grown-up folk would probably have derided his system, but he made us tolerate our lessons and endure the pangs of toothache with some degree of fortitude. He had a short way with the ugly boggles with which thoughtless nurses and chance echoes from the horrors columns of newspapers had peopled the shadows of our life. We were no longer afraid of the dark when he had told us how friendly it could be to the distressed. Hitherto we had vainly sought to find the colors and sounds of romance in life, and, failing, had been tempted to sum up the whole business as tedious. After he had shown us how to do it, it was easy to see that life itself was a story as romantic as we cared to make it. Our daily official walks became gallant expeditions, and we approached arithmetic with a flaming sword. Can any childhood ever have known a greater wizard than this? And yet, since that state does not endure forever, it must surely have happened to us to seek for straws in his towering head once too often, had not death taken our kindly enchanter from our company, and thus spared us the bitter discovery that the one man who reconciled us to life was considered rather more than eccentric by an obtuse world. It is true that we noticed that the grown-up people were apt to treat him sometimes as if he were one of us, but we felt that he merited that distinction, and did not find it strange. Nor did we wonder that he should tell stories aloud to himself, 
lacking a wider audience, for we knew that if we had the power we should tell such stories to ourselves all day long. We did not only fail to realize that he was mad, we knew that he was the only reasonable creature of adult years who ever came near us. He understood us and paid us the supreme compliment of allowing us to understand him. The world called him fantastic for actions that convinced us that he was wise, and thanks to a fate that seemed at the time insensately cruel, the spell was never broken. End of section 4《Section 5 of The Day Before Yesterday》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. — The Day Before Yesterday by Richard Middleton Admirals All When the Christmas holidays are over and pantomimes and parties are cleared away, there is usually a marked revival in a sport that has languished during those exciting weeks. A child who wished to play at boats when the air was full of the smell of tangerine oranges and the glamour of footlights would not be tolerated in any decent schoolroom. But with the reappearance of lessons, there comes a sudden demand for walnut shells and sealing wax and bath night. A thing undesirable while the house is noisy with new tunes becomes the cause of rivalry and passionate argument. So at least it fell in the days when childhood was more than the kernel of an article. The first symptom of the new movement was an eager interest in dessert. We would entreat the Olympians to forgo nutcrackers and to use our new Christmas pocket knives for the purpose of opening their walnuts, and we would regard the results with a keen and professional eye. Were they destined to be clippers, yachts notable in history, or mere utilitarian tubs to be laden with tipsy tin soldiers and sunk ignominiously by brass cannon? We were all naval experts, and our judgments were not often wrong. But even if a walnut shell had the right racing lines, there remained the delicate operation of stepping the mast. The blob of sealing wax had to be dropped in exactly the right place and the whittled safety match that served for the mast must be truly perpendicular, or the craft would be lopsided. The paper sail was as large as safety would permit. There followed regattas in a basin filled to the brim with water. The yachts raced from one side to the other, and someone, assumed neutral, blew with a level breath across the flood to supply the necessary wind. The reward of victory was a little colored flag, that was gummed to the sail of the successful boat. On a memorable day, my swallow beat the hitherto undefeated champion in my eldest brother's Irene, a result the more astonishing that Irene's owner was himself filling the role of Aeolus. I am glad to think that it was Irene that was flung out of the window. Apart from these classic contests, there were secret trials and naval reviews in private waters, and that intimate kind of navigation that took place in one's bath. This last was spiced with an agreeable element of risk, for a rash movement would send the whole fleet to the bottom of the sea, but at the same time in no other way could an admiral have the elements so much under his control. Like Neptune, he could raise a storm at will, and when the ships had battled gallantly against terrible waves and icebergs of patent soap, pair of pink feet would rise above the surface of the ocean, and the fortunate islands would greet the tired eyes of the mariners. It is a fine thing to sail about the world, but it is very good to be at home. Later on, as the weather grew warmer, we indulged in more adventures and let it be admitted a more enjoyable sport. Walnut boats and paper junks ballasted with shot might be well enough for the cold months or wet afternoons, but when the summer called us out to play, our ambitious hearts desired weightier craft than these. Then the yachts that uncles had given us, which had been cruising peacefully on the playroom floor during the indoor weeks, were brought out and considered in their new aspect. There was always something at once thrilling and disappointing about these stately ships. The height of their masts, the intricacy of their rigging, and the little lines that marked the planks of their deck filled us with pride and made us seek the nearest pond with quick elated steps. 
that these things might as well be admired indoors, and somehow these boats never sailed as well on any wakeful pond as they did on the waters of our dreams. There they were forever tossing on the crests of enormous waves, and all night long their great masts went crashing by the board. But on Pickhurst Pond they behaved with a staid monotony, and while we in the boats of our hands had as many moods as the spring, these official craft were content to perform their business of sailing with the conscientious precision of grown-up persons. There was more to be said for the modest sort of boat you would buy for sixpence or a shilling. They had a useless mast and sail. The boat capsized if you set it. Seats that were annoying but easily removed, and sometimes as a crowning piece of Philistinism, oars. We would have scorned to give a moment's consideration to a rowing boat at any time. We wanted only craft that were fit to cruise with equal adroitness on boundless oceans and unhealthy tropic rivers. And, lacking a hold, where would we keep the rum and the pieces of eight? But if you threw away everything but the bare hull and painted that black, you had a very sound basis for sensible boat building. A tin railway carriage would make a cabin. A wooden brick the quarter deck, and if you could find some lead for the keel, you might give the vessel a real mast with which to strike the southern stars. But after all, the best boats were the boats we built entirely ourselves. Our favorite materials were corks, empty matchboxes, and such wood as lies within the scope of a pocket knife. And we would drive tin tacks into the craft until it looked like a nursery cake crowned with burnt currants. The resulting ships varied as to shape and size, but could be trusted to conduct themselves in the water with a charming eccentricity. Sometimes they seemed to skim the waves like birds. Sometimes the water leaped through them with a laugh, and they sank down to join the minnows and the pebbles at the bottom of the stream. In the latter case, the owner would lie flat on the bank, with a sharp stone pressing into his chest, and feel for the lost craft in the cold, slippery waters. For the rest of the morning, his shirt sleeve would cling damply to his skin while the assembled experts considered the failure and made acute suggestions. The stream, we called it a river, on which we sailed these ships, passed in its cheerful course through an iron pipe, and sometimes a vessel that had disappeared merrily under the dark arch would be seen no more of our eyes, though we waited at the other end of the passage perilous until our bodies grew chill in our sailor suits and the mists came rolling up from the water meadows. It was easy to crouch down by the mouth of the pipe and hear the water lap lapping in the dark against the echoing sides of the tunnel, but our ears could tell us nothing, and as we went home, we would speculate in whispers as to the fate of the missing vessel. Had it foundered on some treacherous rock, or was there some mysterious outlet unknown to us through which it had escaped us? Even while we spoke, it might be nodding on merrily towards the night and the stars, through a new, strange country that no one could find in daylight fashion. In truth, there was no game like this, appealing alike to mind and body, and fraught with surprises and enchanting side issues of play. We might launch our vessel at dawn for Babylon, and night would find it dreaming by some South Sea Isle, or lying a shattered wreck on the coast of Brazil. Doubtless to the grown-up observer, who had seen the great sea dotted with little ships, our gutter mishaps and adventures on puddles were of small importance. But as becomes the children of an island race, we played this game with a strange earnestness, and though our boats were small, we knew that they were large enough for little boys to go roaming in through the long day. And that was all that mattered. End of Section 5 Section 6 of The Day Before Yesterday. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Day Before Yesterday by Richard Middleton. A Repertory Theater. Like most great movements in art, it had but a modest beginning. On a memorable day, one of my brothers was looking in the window of a little toy shop when he discovered some of those fascinating sheets of characters to which Stevenson has devoted a charming essay. He happened to have money in his pocket. It was indeed a memorable day. And he brought home his treasure trove with the air of a capitalist who has made a wise investment. 
Schoolroom society approved his enterprise with enthusiasm. We knew nothing about the woodman's hut, the play to which the characters in question belonged. It was enough for us that these figures of men and women were clearly messengers from the land of romance, and their mysterious attitudes only added to the interest with which we regarded them. We got out our paint boxes, and, as unconsciously we were all post-impressionists, we soon made them more mysterious still. It will be remembered that Stevenson remained satisfied with this, which might be regarded as the costumer's work of the model theatre. But we were more ambitious. Our first theatre was a small packing case without any sides, and in this our characters, mounted on cardboard and supplied with firewood supports, were quite contented to display their red legs and green bodies. Our scenery was indicated rather than drawn on brown paper with colored chalks, and would, I think, have pleased Mr. Gordon Craig. Two Christmas tree candles served for footlights, and though we had no book of the words, we made them up as we went along and did very well. It was strange how great a measure of illusion we achieved, although we ourselves moved the puppets and spoke the lines. The candles threw queer shadows across our faces, and it seemed as though deeper voices than ours echoed in the room. We were always being astonished by the eerie products of our own imagination when we were merely trying to amuse ourselves, and the effect of our dramatic efforts was quite remote from anything that we had intended. I understand that older dramatists sometimes experience the same phenomenon. Our activities could not long escape the criticism of the grown-up people, but rather to our surprise, for candles were quite illicit playthings. They contented themselves with a general caution as to the perils of fire, and a particular injunction concerning the dropping of candle grease on the tablecloth. So we played with our theatre till Christmas, by which time the members of our stock company were more than a little battered and weary at the knees. Then there came a surprise. Included in the number of our presents were a little theatre with a real curtain that went up and down, and materials for three complete productions. This time we had not only the characters, but the books of words and scenery as well, and we prepared to do things on an unprecedented scale. As a result, after extraordinary labor in the scenic and costume departments, we were able to produce on three successive nights Paul Clifford, the Corsican Brothers, and the Miller and His Men. The repertory theater was fairly underway. First nights were really thrilling in those days the dignified deportment of our actors, as yet unspoiled by success, roused the audience to enthusiasm, and we did not weary of admiring simple stage effects that would have moved us to scornful laughter in after days. Yet even in these early productions there lurked the seeds of artistic disruption. Already our appreciation of the gallant bearing of Paul Clifford passed all reasonable bounds, and threatened to develop into that hero-worship that proves fatal to the talents of any actor. Already we had an unwholesome craving for excessive realism in the staging of plays, and we made use of the ingenuity of our elders to drive the Grindoff's sinister windmill in the first act of The Miller and His Men. It might be said that our theater, qua repertory theater, was doomed from the start. Nevertheless, at least two seasons of good work were accomplished before our morbid imitation of nature and the illimitable egotism of Paul Clifford finally succeeded in driving art from the stage. During that period we produced about fifteen new plays and gave a large number of one-night revivals. Our repertory ranged from Hamlet to Dick Whittington, and I think one pleased us as much as the other. This would have been more remarkable if Paul Clifford had not played the title part in both plays. We had soon come to prefer him to any other of the heroes, and in consequence, whatever the play may be, he was bound to be there in his riding boots and handsome yellow satin coat. This would have been well enough if he had been willing to keep his place, but he soon became as ubiquitous as an actor-manager. Owing to the number of roles that he was called upon to fill, we had his pasteboard presentment in a hundred different attitudes, and on one occasion, when a stage crowd was required, it was entirely composed of Paul Clifford's, and even then there were rows of forlorn Paul Clifford's in the wings for whom there was no room on the stage. This was the beginning of the end. We suffered from the worst excesses of the star system. We began to be discontented when Paul was not on the stage, 
and we were prepared to boo if that dashing highwayman was not permitted to bluster across the most subtle dramas. About this time we deserted the old theatre that had been the scene of so many triumphs for a larger and far more elaborate one. We had long had gas footlights, but now our system of lighting was intricate enough to suit Mr. Arthur Collins. Indeed, when years afterwards I was allowed to explore the stage of Drury Lane, I found nothing to surprise me, save perhaps the electric switchboard with its pretty display of diminutive electric lights. Our scenic sensations were only surpassed by those of Mr. Bruce Smith. When we played the dramatization of Hard Cash, the scuttled vessel sank in a sea of real water. The fountains in our garden of enchantment flung scented torrents into their moss-clad basins, and when we sought to reproduce a burning house, we succeeded in setting the theater on fire. It will be understood that by that time we had come to rely on the grown-up people for assistance in producing plays, and we had substituted their perverted adult taste for our juvenile conceptions of drama. The old plays, with their homely characters and dignified simplicity of setting, no longer pleased us. We craved for a debauch of Paul Clifford, and every new production had to be more elaborate in its insentient mimicry of life than the one before. The inevitable happened. The more our stage setting approximated to nature, and the more Paul pirouetted in the limelight, the less we attained to that illusion which had been so easy to achieve on a packing-case stage with two little colored candles for footlights. There came a day when Paul no longer interested us, and we felt that we had exhausted the possibilities of the sensational. The theater was closed, and when many months afterwards a vague curiosity led us to ask what had become of it, we learnt with but little regret that our elders had given it away to some little boy whose taste in drama was as yet unsophisticated. I wonder what he made of our real sea and our practicable fountains. Not very long ago I was turning over some old books when a small piece of cardboard slipped from between the pages and fell to the ground. It was in the likeness of a man, a man dressed in riding boots and yellow satin, yet it was some moments before I realized that I was in the presence of the once great Paul Clifford. With recognition came something like remorse. It was no more than just to forgive his faults after so many years, and he really was a very good actor, until an excess of praise turned his little pasteboard head. I looked around the library, and after due consideration, took a volume of the laureate's poems from the shelves, and laid the tired highwayman to rest between its pages. Sleep on, brave Paul, I said softly. No one will ever disturb you there. And now I have written his epitaph. End of section six. Recording by Fafford. Section seven of The Day Before Yesterday. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Julia Mihaeva. The Day Before Yesterday by Richard Middleton. Children and the Spring. Poets and careless happy fellows like that may say what they like for the spring, but there are only two seasons in the year for children. The parties of Christmas appeal to our senses in a hundred pleasant ways. They shone with Jack Frost and Chinese lanterns and the gay gelatin from crackers. They compressed our limbs in the pride of new, uncomfortable suits and tight shiny shoes. They tasted of burnt raisins and orange jelly. They sang with frosty carols and sensible tunes and the agreeable din of penny musical instruments. They smelt of Christmas tree candles and tangerine oranges. Then there were pantomimes and large silver pieces from the pockets of millionaire uncles, and if all else failed, the possibility of snow. Certainly there was nothing the matter with winter. Summer, too, had its fierce and measurable joys. This was the season of outdoor sports, hunting and boating and digging holes to New Zealand. There was cricket, real cricket, which means that you are out if you hit the ball into the next garden and that you stop playing if you break a window. And there was hurling of javelins and wild shrubberies, and dabbling in silver brooks for elusive minnows. 
Later there would come long, adventurous journeys in railway trains, when, like wise travellers, we would cuddle provisions of buns and pears and tippet sandwiches in our laps. Our legs would be so stiff when we reached our destination that we would totter on the platform like old men, and our eyes would be weary with watching the fleeting world. But as the cab crept up the greedy hills, we would see the ocean waiting for us to come and play with it, and everything else in life would be forgotten. The country, with its apple trees and its pigs and its secret places, was not to be despised, but it was the sea that led us home to our dreams. Yet possibly the finest thing that the summer had to give us was the healthy, joyous sense of fatigue that comes from games. It was pleasant to drop on the lawn when cricket was over, and stay there, not wholly displeased with the scent of the flowers, looking into the blue sky until the nuts drove you in to tea. It was pleasant to lie on the beach, with the heat creeping up and down your face, and to let the sand trickle through your fingers, while the long waves whispered out to sea. It was pleasant to drowse in the hay after hunting buffaloes all the sunny afternoon. It was only at such moments when the air had a savour of sleep, that we really felt conscious of youth as a desirable possession. A child's year would be divided abruptly into winter and summer, for youth is impatient of compromise. But as things are, there are spring and autumn to be reckoned with. For autumn, there is not much to be said. There were nuts and blackberries and the sweet-scented fallen leaves, in which we would paddle up to our knees, but the seaside brown was wearing off our legs, and night came so soon and with so harsh and boisterous a note. It wasn't bad when we happened to be feeling very brave to lie awake at night and hear the branches screaming when the wind heard them. The sheer discomfort of the outer world made bad delicious, but the necessary courage for this point of view was rare, and normally we would wish the nights quieter and less exciting. The autumn wind was forever fumbling at our nursery windows like a burglar, or creeping along the passages like a supernatural thing. Sometimes our hearts stopped beating while we listened. But of all the seasons of the year, spring is most oppressive to the spirit of childhood. The dear artificial things that had made the winter lovely were gone, and the pastoral delights of the summer were still to come. Yet nature called us forth to a muddy, unfinished world. Then was the season of the official walk, a dreary traffic on nice, clean pavements that placed everything in the world worth walking to out of bounds. A cold wind without the compensating advantage of snow would swing round the corners of streets, and we would feel as if we were wearing the ears and noses of other people. When we weren't quarrelling, we were sulking, and each was equally fatal, for the Olympians only needed a pretext to make our days bitter, with iron and quinine and our quarrels that at kinder seasons of the year were the regretted accidents of moments, lingered now from day to day, and became the source of fierce and lonely pride. If one of us, released for a minute from the wearing of the world's vows, made timid efforts to arrange a concerted game, he would become the object of general suspicion, and his sociability would be regarded as a hypocritical effort to win the favour of the grown-up folk. The correct attitude was one of surly aloofness that spluttered once or twice a day into tearful rebellion against the interference of the authorities. It is insulting to give a man medicine when he tells you that he wishes he were dead. Of course, underlying these disorders was just the dim spirit of disquiet that has made this season of the year notable for the production of lyric poetry. We had no means of expressing the thing that troubled our blood. Indeed, we ourselves didn't know what was the matter, though this ignorance didn't make our discomfort less. Time, who in the glare of a Christmas party or on the shore of a summer sea could run faster than we, seemed to take a spiteful pleasure in lingering in this unattractive place, and although our attitude towards life appeared to have been determined for us by fate, when the long day ended and we thought over things in bed, we hadn't even the satisfaction of being proud of our day's work. We would vow silently to our pillows that things should go better tomorrow, but alas, there might be many morrows before summer brought peace to our blood. 
it is not only children whom the spring winds stir to madness but a man has striven but poorly if he cannot contrive to bear in patience with this vernal torment of living or even to turn it to some useful purpose in his work but children who can only express themselves in their play must pay for the joys of the coming summer in moods speechless and almost too bitter for their years in sympathy with all the green quick things of nature their blood is in a state of passionate unrest for which their minds can supply no adequate reason and they are unhappy in consequence but i am far from blaming the olympians for the attitude they adopted in this difficult business they kept a wise eye on our health and if our naughtiness became outrageous we were punished for the rest as they couldn't give us lips of silver and a pipe of gold with which to chant the amazing gladness of the spring i do not see what they could do End of section seven. Section eight of the day before yesterday. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. The day before yesterday by Richard Middleton. On nursery cupboards. They were deep and wide and tall, and filled as to the lower shelves with a number of objects which no child of spirit could find interesting any longer. Here were the battered fragments of the presents of bygone birthdays, of which the true ownership was dubious, because we none of us would confess that we had ever been young enough to receive such childish gifts. Here also were foolish trifles from forgotten Christmas trees useless objects employed by the fraudulent to give their trees a deceitful appearance of wealth then there were the presents that were too useful the elevating gifts of aunts and the improving offerings of godparents things that either trespassed on the arid land of lessons or presumed some grown-up virtue which the recipient neither had nor coveted the olympians would refer to these dull possessions in the aggregate as the children's toys but we knew better our true treasures the things we loved never saw the inside of that unromantic depository save through the thoughtless tidying of our rulers the works of watches and mechanical toys our soldiers and cannons of brass our fleet of walnut boats and empty cartridge cases these things and their brothers slept under our pillows or in the very private cardboard boot box under the bed by day those that were being employed were spread about the floor or strained our pockets to bursting point the people who were too old to know any better referred to them contemptuously as rubbish a word we privately reserved for their aggravating presence and though the long interval that separated dinner and tea on wet days might weary us of our immediate jewels it was not in the cupboard that we sought relief from boredom it is true that now and again some gentleman adventurer would climb on a chair and investigate the shelves that were supposed to be beyond our reach to return with piratical spoil of matches and cotton and citrate of magnesia a cake that tingles pleasantly on the tongue of youth but even from this point of view it could not compare with the rich cupboards of the kitchen and the dining-room those meccas of piracy that filled our dreams with monstrous raisins and pickled onions a successful pilgrimage to which would assure a man the admiring homage of his comrades for days to come in short we were content to regard the toy cupboard as a harmless hobby of the grown-up people and we were not far wrong it was not for them to understand that one general cupboard could not hold the real treasures of four children whose sense of possession was keen even to the point of battle it was a dustbin for toys that had been found out and we would have scorned to display its sordid contents to our friends to them if they were worthy were revealed the true mysteries the things that we fought for and made into dreams the sun and moon and stars of our imaginative heaven sentimental elders might greet it with tears for their lost youth if they wished we received their congratulations calmly and kept our pity for their insanity to ourselves in truth the thing was a symbol for all our relations with grown-up people 
they always seemed so sensible and yet they could not understand if we fell off the banisters on to our heads they would overwhelm us with sympathy when every one knows that a big lump on the head is a thing to be proud of but if a well-meaning aunt insisted on reading to us for a whole afternoon in the horse chestnut season we were expected and even commanded to be grateful for this undesired favor and so it was in the matter of toys sometimes by accident as it were they gave us sensible things that we really wanted but as a rule their presents were concrete things that gave our imaginations no chance we only wanted something to make a think about but few of the official presents were suitable for this purpose one of the gifts that delighted me most as a child was a blue glass dish large and shallow filled with water it became a real blue sea very proper for the navigation of smaller craft empty and subverted it became the dome of an azure city and holding it before my eyes i would see a blue world a place the existence of which i had previously only suspected an ocean a city and a world combined to make a better present than a commonplace toy once in a blue moon i have seen strange sights and something of the glamour of that dish is with me even now naturally in course of time an uncommon significance became attached to such things as this and i should have no more thought of keeping my blue sea in the same cupboard as my brother's maxim gun than he would have allowed that excellent weapon to be the bedfellow of my sister's famous one-leg nigger doll we realize far better than our elders the meaning of their favourite shibboleth a place for everything we knew that the sea air would rust a cannon and that poor dorothy could swim but poorly with her one dusky leg so we tacitly left the cupboard as a place wherein the grown-ups could keep the toys they gave us to please themselves and found exclusive and more sympathetic hiding-places for our treasures now and again a toy might pass through both stages of existence mechanical toys did not amuse us at all until the donors were tired of playing with them and we might pull them to pieces and make them our very own and the costly gifts of uncles were useless until the authorities had ceased to see that we took care of them but these doubtful cases apart we would divide our presents into their respective groups as soon as we had removed the wrappings this and this can go into the cupboard but this shall go to bed with me to-night it was not the person who understands children who was most fortunate in the choice of gifts for the rest with unconscious satire we constituted the toy cupboard the state prison of the nursery refractory dolls and kittens and soldiers awaiting court-martial repented their crimes in its depressing gloom and this was really the only share it had in our amusements beyond that it stood merely for official play a melancholy traffic in which we never indulged its shelves were crowded with the illusions of grown-up people and if we considered it at all it was in the same aspect in which we were wont to regard them they were obviously well-meaning but somehow or other they lacked understanding and the nursery cupboard was full in consequence end of section eight section nine of the day before yesterday this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. the day before yesterday by richard middleton the fat man i met him first at lords the best place perhaps in all london for making acquaintances and even friends even if he had not worn a light suit of clothes that drew the critical eye inevitably to his monstrous girth he would have been conspicuous as occupying with difficulty the space provided for two persons on an afternoon when seats were at a premium but though i own to no prejudice against flesh in itself it was not his notable presence that induced me to speak to him but rather the appealing glances that he threw to right and left of him when he thought to have detected that fine wine of the game which tasted socially 
changes a cricket match to a rare and solemn festival such an invitation is one that no one for whom cricket is an inspiration can refuse and it was natural that thereafter we should praise and criticise in wise and sympathetic chorus the acquaintance thus begun warmed to intimacy at the oval and canterbury and i began to seek his easily recognisable figure on cricket grounds with eagerness to feel a pang of disappointment if he was not there for though to his careless eye his great moonlike face might suggest no more than good-natured stupidity i had soon discovered that this exuberance of form barely concealed a delicate and engaging personality that within those vast galleries of flesh there roamed the timid spirit of a little child i have said that to the uncritical his face might seem wanting in intelligence but it was rather that the normal placidity of his features suggested a lack of emotional sensitiveness save with his eyes and it needed experience to read their message he had no means of expressing his minor emotions no compromise between his wonted serenity and the monstrous phenomenon of his laughter that induced a facial metamorphosis almost too startling to convey an impression of mirth if normally his face might be compared with a deep still pool laughter may be said to have stirred it up with a stick and the consequent ripples seemed to roll to the very extremities of his body growing in force as they went so that his hands and feet vibrated in humorous ecstasy later when in one of his quaint interrogative moods he showed me a photograph of himself as a child i was able to give form to the charming spirit that nature had burdened with this grievous load i saw the picture of a strikingly handsome little boy with dark wide eyes and slightly parted lips that alike told of a noble sense of wonder this i felt was the man i knew whose connection with that monstrous shape of flesh had been so difficult to trace yet strangely i could recognize the features of the boy in the expansive areas of the man in the light of the photograph he resembled one of those great cabbage roses that a too lavish season has swollen beyond all flower-like proportions yet which are none the less undeniably roses others might find him clumsy elephantine colossal thenceforward he was for me clearly boyish his voice varied more in tone and quality than that of any other man i have ever met and over these variations he seemed to have little control and this too made it very difficult for strangers to detect the trippings and hesitancies gentle wayward and infinitely sensitive of his childlike temperament within the limits of one simple utterance he would achieve sounds resembling the drumming of sudden rain on galvanized iron and the ecstatic whistlings of dew-drunk birds it was sometimes difficult to follow the purport of his speech for sheer wonder at the sounds that slid and leaped and burst from his lips his voice reminded me of a child strumming on some strange musical instrument of extraordinary range and capacity which it had not learnt how to play his laughter was ventriloquial and rarely bore any accountable relationship to the expressions of mirth of ordinary men it was like an explosive rendering of one of those florid scales dear to piano tuners but sometimes it suggested rather an earthquake in his boots he dwelt in a little flat that seemed like the upper floor of a doll's house when he related to its proprietor 
and here it was his delight to dispense a hospitality charmingly individual his meals recalled nothing so much as the illicit feasts held in school dormitories and when he peered curiously into his own cupboards he always looked as if he were about to steal jam he would produce viand after viand with the glee of a successful explorer and in terms of his eager hospitality the most bizarre cates appeared congruous and even intimately connected so that at his board grown men would eat like schoolboys with the great careless appetite of youth he had a fine library and a still finer collection of mechanical toys which were for him a passion and a delight it was pleasant to see him set some painted piece of clockwork careering on the hearthrug stooping over it tenderly with wondering eyes and hands intent to guard it from disaster it was pleasant too to hear him recite swinburne of whom he was a passionate admirer for though his voice would be as rebellious as ever his whole body would thrill and pulse with the music of the poet he always touched books softly because he loved them of bonfires he spoke reverently though a london flat hardly lent itself to their active exploitation and i remember that he told me once that nothing gave him a keener sense of what he had lost in growing up than the scent of burning twigs and leaves yet if he felt this loss what should it have been for us who had come so much farther than he himself a child he was beloved of children and treated by them as an equal but i never knew another child who was so easily and continuously amused the hippodrome the british museum the tower of london and the art of messrs maskelyne and devant alike raised in him the highest enthusiasm which he expressed with charming but sometimes embarrassing freedom alone of all men perhaps he found the royal academy wholly satisfying and it could be said of him truly that if he did not admire the picture he would always like the frame he had a huge admiration for any one who did anything and he liked riding in lifts though he treated women with elaborate courtesy their society made him self-conscious and he who could direct his body featly enough in a crowded street was apt to be clumsy in drawing-rooms perhaps it was for this reason that they had apparently played no marked part in his life and i may be wrong in attaching any special significance to a phrase he made one quiet evening in his flat we had been speaking of the latest sensation in our group of mutual acquaintances of the marriage of phyllis daintiest and most witty of cricket lovers to a man in whom the jealously critical eyes of her friends could perceive no charm but the conversation had dwindled to silence when he said surely his love can make any man lovely then as if the subject were closed he fell to speaking of his latest pocket-knife with a boyish animation but the phrase dwelt in my mind though the image of the brave boy with wide eyes and lips parted in wonder was all that i ever knew of the man who made it End of section nine. Section ten of the day before yesterday. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The day before yesterday by Richard Middleton. Section ten. Carol singers. When we were boys, there was no part of the Christmas festivities to which we looked forward more eagerly than the singing of carols from house to house on Christmas Eve. If the night fell wild and rainy, we had to abandon our tuneful journey and content ourselves with singing indoors. 
but if it was a dry night we set forth joyfully even though a disquieted moon and inattentive stars foretold a wet christmas our hearts were lighter than men's hearts can be as we clattered down the lanes fortified by a hot supper and possibly a scalding tumbler full of mulled claret we would always start at the houses of friends and then made bold by success we would sing our glad tidings to any house which had a lit window for the credit of human nature it may be said that we were made welcome wherever we went sometimes people offered us money which our code forbade us to accept though we should have liked it well enough more frequently we were asked to come in and have something to eat or drink offers with which even the infinite capacity of youth could by no means cope if the night was frosty it was pleasant to toast ourselves for a minute or two in front of the fire before going out again into a world of frozen ruts sparkling hedgerows and mysterious shadows wherein we felt ourselves veritable figures of romance and indeed we ourselves sang better than we knew however cheerfully and noisily we might undertake the expedition it was not long before we became aware that other spirits were abroad the simple words and merry tunes which we sang suddenly became wonderfully significant between the verses we heard the sheep calling on far hills while the shepherd kings rode down to bethlehem with their gifts the trees and fields and houses took up the chant and our noises were blended with that deep song of the universe which the new ears of the young hear so often and so clearly when our carol was over there would fall a great silence that seemed to our quickened senses to be but a gentler and sweeter music of hope and joy as we passed from one house to the next we spoke to each other in whispers for fear we should break the spell that held the night enchanted even as we heard other noises when we sang so now we heard the sound of other feet that trod the same glad road as our own from being half a dozen of little boys come out to have some fun on christmas eve we had become a small section of a great army tramp tramp the joyful feet fell before and behind us along the road and when we stopped to sing the whole night thrilled into a triumphant ecstasy of song on such nights the very earth it seemed sang carols it is perhaps our vivid recollection of the glories of those memorable christmas eves that leads us to be gentle with the little boys and girls who sing at our door to-night we have all listened to the eloquent persons who can prove that christmas is not what it used to be they point to the decadence of pantomime the decay of the waits and mummers and the democratic impudence of those who demand christmas boxes well it may be but children do like modern pantomimes in spite of the generalizations of critics and though a salvation army band is an unpicturesque substitute for such a village orchestra as is described in under the greenwood tree it at least satisfies the ear of the sentimentalist at two o'clock of a frosty morning that christmas boxes are a nuisance is no new discovery we find swift grumbling to stella about them exactly two hundred years ago mummers we are told are still to be found in the country five years back we saw them ourselves and were satisfied that they had learnt their rather obscure rhymes from their fathers before them and not from any well-meaning society for faking old customs this said it must be admitted that carol singers are not what they were of the long procession of ragged children who have sung while shepherds watched their flocks by night at our gate this december not one had taken the trouble to learn either the words or the tune accurately when asked to sing some other carol they broke down and it was apparent that they were trusting to their hungry and thinly clad appearance rather than to their singing as a means to obtain alms from the charitable sometimes this we fear is a really modern note the father was waiting in the background to collect the takings it is rather difficult to know what to do in such cases for the children may be punished if they are not successful and yet the practice of sending insufficiently clad children into the streets on a winter's night is hardly to be encouraged nevertheless though the abuse is manifest we would hesitate to say that the custom of singing carols at our doors should be stopped it is difficult to read the heart of a child aright but it seems to us at least possible that a few of the children win more than a mere handful of pennies from their singing though they mumble their words to a tune they only half remember it is not likely that the spirit that made wonderful the christmas eves of long ago shall altogether pass them by 
surely the night conspires with lights of the world to enchant them and for their own ears their voices achieve beauty beyond the measure of mortal song in truth this is a dream that we can ill afford to spare it seems a pity however that the children are not taught carol singing at school especially as they are now often taught to our great content the old games and dances many of the older carols are really beautiful both in the homely simplicity of their words and in the unaffected charm of the airs to which they are set the desire of the average child for song is extraordinary as extraordinary perhaps as the regrettable contempt of the average adult for poetry last year we were present at the dress rehearsal of the pantomime at drury lane and we heard a theatre full of poor children sing the music hall ditties of the hour with wonderful spirit and intensity our emotions were mixed mingled with the natural pleasure that they should be enjoying themselves was something of regret for the sad lives that so small a treat should rouse to ecstasy afterwards we felt sorry that the children had nothing better to sing we have no prejudice against music hall songs in general they are not as intelligent as they might be but they serve their time in pleasing harmlessly enough a number of people who also are not as intelligent as they might be but somehow the liars of little singing children deserve better fare than this we look forward to a time when they will have it end of section ten recording by philip gould section eleven of the day before yesterday this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Day Before Yesterday by Richard Middleton Section 11. The Magic Carpet There were two rugs in the library, and for some time we used to dispute the vexed question of their relative merits. Aesthetically there was something to be said for both of them. The rug that stood by the writing desk from which father wrote to the newspapers was soft and furry. Indeed, it was almost as pleasant a couch as the sofa with the soft cushions in the drawing room, which was taboo. Moreover, it lent itself very readily to such fashionable winter sports as bear hunting, providing as it did a trackless prairie, a dangerous marsh, or the quarry itself as the adventure required. The joys of the other rug were of a calmer kind, and were perhaps chiefly due to its advantageous position before the fire. It was pleasant to toast oneself on a winter evening and trace with idle fingers the agreeable deviations of its pattern. Sometimes it might be the ground plan of a make-up city, with forts and sweet shops and palaces for our friends. Sometimes it would be a maze, and we would pursue with bated breath the vaulted passages that led to the dread lear of the Minotaur. But such plots as these were of passive rather than active interest. Reviewing the argument dispassionately, Fenimore Cooper may have had a slight advantage over Nathaniel Hawthorne. Bear hunting may have been a little more popular than the dim excitements of Greek myth. But while the discussion was at its height, there dawned in the east the sun that was to prove fatal to Perseus and the deer-slayer alike. I do not know from which of our uncles the Arabian Nights first came to an enraptured audience, but I am sure that an uncle must have been responsible for its coming, for as a gift it was avuncular in its splendor. We quickly realized that the world had changed and took the necessary steps to welcome our new guest. The old lamp in the hall that had graced the illicit doings of pirates and smugglers in the past was thenceforward the property of Aladdin. A strange bottle that had been Crusoe's served to confine the unfortunate genie, and with quickening pulses we discovered that in the fireside rug we possessed no less a treasure than the original magic carpet. I must explain that we were not like those fortunate children of whom Miss Nesbitt writes with such humorous charm. To us there fell no tremendous adventures. We might polish Aladdin's lamp till it shone like the moon without gaining a single concrete acid drop for our pains. But the Arabian Nights gave us all that we ever thought of seeking either in books or toys in those uncritical days, a starting point for our dreams. And this, I take it, is the best thing that a writer can give a child, and it was for lack of this that we considered the works of Lewis Carroll silly, while finding one of the books of Miss Molesworth, 
I wish I could recall its name, a masterpiece of fancy and erudition. So when the den of the schoolroom did not suit my mood, or the authorities were unduly didactic, I would slip away to the twilit library and guide the magic carpet through the delicate meadows of my dreams. The fire would blaze and crackle in the grate and fill my eyes with tears so that it was easy to fancy myself in a sparkling world of sunshine. And from the shadows of the room little creatures would creep out to touch my glowing cheeks with cool, soft fingers, or to pluck timidly at the sleeve of my coat. I did not endeavor to give these shy companions of the dark any definite place in my universe. Their sympathetic reticence was reassuring in that room of great leaping shadows, and I was glad that they should keep me company in the blackness, a thing so terrible when I woke up at night in my bed. Sometimes, perhaps, I wondered how they could bear to live in the place where nightmare was, but for the rest I accepted their society gladly and without question. There was plenty of room on the carpet for such quiet fellows, and if they liked to accompany me on my travels, I at least would not prevent them. It did not occur to me at the time, as it certainly does now, that I should never again be so near to fairyland as I was then. I was inclined to be skeptical concerning the actual existence of the supernatural, though I recognized that a judicious acceptance of its theory set a new kingdom beneath one's feet for play. And it is only now that I realize how wonderfully vivid my dreams were, with what zest of timid life the little shadow folk thrilled and trembled round me. It is true that I remain conscious of my normal environment. The fire, the dark room, and the bookcases were all there and even a kind of quiet sense of the world beyond the door, the hall and the passages, and my brothers and sisters at their quarrels. But it was as if these things had become merely an idea in my mind, while my feet were set on the pleasant roads of a new world. The thing that I had hoped became true, and the truth that I had been taught lingered in my mind only as a familiar story, a business of second-hand emotions, neither very desirable nor very interesting. The little folk gathered and whispered round me in the dark, and there was full day in the world that was my own. It was hard to leave that world for this other place, which even now I cannot understand. But when some errant Olympian or righteously indignant brother had dragged me from my lair, I did not attempt to defend myself from the charge of moodiness. I had no words to tell them what they had done and I could only stand blinking beneath the light of the gas in the hall, and endeavor to recall their wholly tiresome rules and regulations for the life of youth. Dimly I knew that my right place was before the fire in the library, and I wondered whether the little folk could use the magic carpet without me, or whether they stayed expectant in the shadows, like me, a little lonely and a little chill. But in those days moodiness was only a lesser crime than sulkiness, and I had perforce to fold up my fancies and pass, an emotional bankrupt, into the unsympathetic world of the playroom. Tomorrow, perhaps, the magic carpet might be mine again. Meanwhile, I would exist. Peter Pan has asked us a good many times whether we believe in fairies. It is, of course, a matter of faith, to be accepted or denied, but not to be discussed. For my part, I think of a little boy nodding on a rug before the fire on many a winter's evening, and I clap my hands. Gratitude could do no less. End of section 11. Recording by Philip Gould. Section 12 of The Day Before Yesterday. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Day Before Yesterday by Richard Middleton Stage Children I do not know that at any time Hastings is a very lively place. The houses have acquired a habit of being vacant, and even the front, with its bath chairs, its bandstands that are silent on Sundays, and its seats upon which one may not smoke, is more suggestive of Puritans and invalids than of pleasure. If time should suddenly drop a week from the due order of days, it is easy to imagine that those bath chairs, those unfragrant shelters, those much-labelled houses would startle the dreaming tourists with vacant faces of dead men. 
But when in late March the day has squandered its gold and the earth is saddened with the gentle greyness of the dusk, when, moreover, the cheerful sea has deserted the shore, creeping far out to leave dull acres of untrodden sand, waste and bitter with salt, a man might surely be forgiven if he cried aloud against the extreme cruelty of nature, timid injustice of man. Being of Anglo-Saxon blood, I did not give definite expression to the melancholy which the quenched seascape had invoked. I contented myself with leaning on the rail and sneering at the art of the cripple who had made mathematically exact scratchings of Windsor Castle and the Ediston Lighthouse on the sand. There was something almost humorously impertinent about the twisted figure with one foot, bowing and hopping for pennies in front of a terrible backcloth of dreamy grey. How could a man forget the horrors of infinite space and scratch nothings on the blank face of the earth for coppers? His one foot was bare so that his silver-like activities might not spoil his pitches, and when he was not hopping he shivered miserably. As I saw him at the moment he stood very well for humanity, sordid, grotesque, greedy of mean things, twisted and bruised by the pitiless hand of nature. And then, in a flash, there happened one of those miracles which rebuke us when we lack faith. Through the shadows which were not grey but purple, there burst a swarm of children running on light feet across the sands. They chased each other hither and thither, stooped to gather shells and seaweed, and inspected the works of the cripple with outspoken admiration. Regarding my mournful and terrible world in detail, they found it beautiful with pink shells and tangled seaweed and the gallant efforts of men. So far from being terrified or humiliated by the sombre wastes of sand and sky, they made of the one a playground and woke the other with echoes of their shrill laughter. Perhaps they found that the sea was rather larger than the serpentine. Perhaps they thought that the sands were not so well lit as Kingsway. But, after all, they were making holiday, and at such a time things are different. They laughed at space. For these were London children, and all the resources of civilization had not been able to deprive them of that sense of proportion which we lose with age. The stars are small and of little importance, and even the sun is not much larger than a brandy ball but a golden pebble by the seashore is a treasure that a child may hold in its hand, and it is certain that never a grown-up one of us can own anything so surely. We may search our memories for sunsets and tresses of dead girls, but who would not give all their faded fragrance for one pink shell and the power to appreciate it? So it was that I had found the world wide and ugly and terrible, lacking the Aladdin's lamp of imagination, which had shown the children that it was a place of treasure, with darkness to make the search exciting. They flitted about the beach like eager moths. Yet on these children civilization had worked with her utmost cunning, with her most recent resource. For they were little actors and actresses from Drury Lane, touring in a pantomime of their own, wise enough in the world's ways to play grown-up characters with uncommon skill, and bred in the unreality of the footlights and the falsehood of grease paints. Nevertheless, coming straight from the elaborate make-believe of the theatre and the intoxicating applause, they ran down to the sea to find the diamonds and pearls that alone are real. If this is not wisdom, I know not where wisdom lies, and watching them I could have laughed aloud at the thought of the critics who have told me that the life of the stage makes children unnatural. There are many wise and just people who do not like to see children acting, forgetting perhaps that mimicry is the keynote of all child's play, and that nothing but this instinct leads babies to walk upright and to speak with their tongues. Whether they are on the stage or not, children are always borrowing the words and emotions of other people, and it is a part of the charm of childhood that through this mask of tricks and phrases the real child peeps always into the eyes and hearts of the elect. And this is why I know nothing more delightful than the spectacle of a score of children playing at life on the stage. They may have been taught how to speak and how to stand and what to do with their hands. They may know how to take a prompt and realise the importance of dressing the stage. Every trick and mannerism of the grown-up actor or actress may be theirs, yet through their playing they will sound the voice of childhood, imaginative, adventurous, insistent, and every performance will supply them with materials for a new game. So it was with these children whose sudden coming had strewn the melancholy beach with pearls. I had seen them in the dimness of a ballet room under Drury Lane Theatre. Now, with a coin, I bought the right to see them on a stage built with cynical impertinence in the midst of an intolerant sea. The play, indeed, was the same, and the players, but the game was different. 
the little breaks and falterings which the author had not designed, the only half-suppressed laughings which were not in the prompt copy, bore no relationship, one might suppose, to the moral adventures of Mother Goose. But far across the hills the spring was breaking the buds on the lilac, and far along the shore the sea was casting its jewels, and even there in the theatre I could see the children standing on tiptoe to pick lilac and stooping on the sands to gather pearls. They did not see that they were in a place of lank ropes and unsmooth boards soiled with the dust of forgotten pageants and rendered hideous by the glare of electric lights, and they were right, for in their eyes there shone only that place of adventure which delights the feet of the faithful, whether they tread the sands or the stage or the rough cobbles of Drury Lane. To the truly imaginative, a theatre is a place of uncommon possibilities. Our actors and actresses, and even our limelight men, are not imaginative, and so I suppose they find it ugly. The game is with the children, and truly they play it for all it is worth, and they are wise enough to know that it is worth all things alike on the boards of the theatre and on the wider but hardly less artificial stage of civilised life. We who are older tremble between our desire for applause and our unconquerable dread of the angers of the critical gods and the gaping pit, and it is for this reason that every bitter-wise adult knows himself to be little better than a super, a unit of a half-intelligent chorus, who may hope at best to echo with partial accuracy the songs and careless laughters of the divine players. There is something pathetic in the business, for we, too, were once stars, and thought finely enough to hold the heavens for ever with our dreams. But now we are glad if the limelight shines by accident for a moment on our faces, or if the stage manager gives us but one individual line. We feel for all the sad fragrance of our old programmes and newspaper cuttings that it is a privilege to play a part in the pageant at all. The game is with the children, but if we are wise, there is still somewhere at the back of the stage a place where each one of us can breathe the atmosphere of enchantment and dream the old dreams. No Arcadia is ever wholly lost. End of section 12「Section thirteen of the day before yesterday. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. The day before yesterday by Richard Middleton. Oxford and Cambridge. When I hear grown up people discussing the university boat race, I smile sadly and hold my peace. They may say what they like about the latest Oxford trial or the average weight per man of the Cambridge crew, but deep in my heart there stays the conviction that they are making a ludicrous mistake in speaking about the boat race at all. Once I knew all about it, and even now I think I could put them right if I wished, but what is the use of arguing with persons who, under the absurd pretext of fairness, pretend to find praiseworthy features in both crews? Even the smallest boy knew better than that in the days when the boat race was really important. I will not say that there did not exist weaklings even then, who wobbled between Oxford and Cambridge in an endeavour to propitiate both factions, but they usually suffered the fate of wobblers by having to join one side or the other, while still incurring the scorn of both. The boat race dawned upon us each year as a strange and bewildering element in our social relationships we would part one night on normal terms and the morrow would find us wearing strange favours and regarding our friends of yesterday with open and passionate dislike for the sake of a morsel of coloured ribbon old friendships would be shattered and brother would meet brother with ingenious expressions of contempt there was no moderate course in the matter a boy was either vehemently cambridge or intolerably oxford and it would have been easier to account for the colour of his hair than to explain how he arrived at his choice of a university some blind instinct some subtle influence felt perhaps in the dim far-off nursery days may have determined for this weighty choice but the whole problem was touched with the mystery that inspired the great classical and modern snowball fights when little boys would pound each other almost into a state of unconsciousness for the sake of a theory of education our interest in the boat race as a boat race was small 
and quite untroubled by any knowledge of the respective merits of the crews but we wore their colors in our buttonholes and the effect of these badges on our lives was anarchic we saw blue it was my fate to drift fatally and immutably cambridge into a school that had a crushing oxford majority in these circumstances the light blue ribbon became for the small and devoted band that upheld the cambridge tradition of valor the cause of endless but never conclusive defeats the symbol of a splendid martyrdom try as we might we found ourselves always in a minority and to add to our bitterness these years of luckless warfare coincided with a series of cambridge defeats and we knew ourselves the supporters of a forlorn and discredited cause and yet fate having decreed that we should be cambridge we did not falter before our hopeless task of convincing the majority that it was made of baser stuff than we we would arrive in the morning with our colors stitched to our coats and when overwhelmed by numbers we lost our dear favors we would retire to a place apart repair the loss from a secret store of ribbon and dash once more into the fray the others might be oxford when they had a mind to but we were cambridge cambridge all the time our contests were always fierce but only once so far as i remember did they become really venomous some ingenious cambridge mind had hit on the idea of protecting his badge with a secret battery of pins and there ensued a series of real and desperate fights that threatened our clan with physical extinction the trouble passed as suddenly as it had arisen a mysterious rumor went round the clans that pins were bad form and there was a lull while cambridge treated their black eyes and oxford put sticking plaster on their torn fingers pleasanter to remember is the famous retort of l an utterance so finely dramatic that even to-day i cannot recall it without a thrill caught apart from his comrades he was surrounded by the oxford rabble and robbed of his colors you aren't cambridge now said one of his assailants mockingly ah but the sky is cambridge he replied and indeed it was we had our little victories to dull the edge of our defeats and yet probably we of cambridge were not altogether sorry when the boat race was over and the business might be forgotten for another eleven months for we had but little rest while the war of the ribbons was in the air if we sought to take a quiet walk round the quad the chance was that a boy too small perhaps to keep a favor even for a minute but with a light blue heart would run up with tidings of some comrade hardly beset in the cloisters and the battle must be begun again these contests were sometimes the cause of temporary friendships for in the course of the tumult one would find oneself indebted to a year-long enemy for the timely discomfiture of one's opponent who in his turn might be normally one's bosom companion for no tie was sacred enough to overcome this vernal madness of the blues if a fellow was base enough to be oxford his presence in the world was unnecessary his society tabooed and as i have said even brothers would bang each other's heads for the beauty of the idea then came a day when age and responsibility changed our views on a good many things and the boat race was not spared forgetful of the old triumphs and the old despairs we preferred to treat ourselves and life in more sober terms while smiling tolerantly at the little boys playing their rough games beneath our feet leaning forward with hands eager to clutch our manhood we would not for worlds have compromised our new position by taking an interest in such childish trifles as colored ribbons so the game went on without us and the measure of our loss is the measure of the loss of the earth when the spring melts into summer to-day i hear persons discussing the boat race in railway carriages and in face of their dispassionate judgments i ask myself whether they can ever have sung for it and fought for it and let it be added wept for it as i have done in truth i suppose they have for boys do not differ widely in these essential things but these people do not fight they do not even wear the ribbon while it is open to a man to ignore the boat race altogether i cannot understand his approaching the contest 
in so miserable a spirit end of section thirteen section fourteen of the day before yesterday this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the day before yesterday by richard middleton section fourteen herald i suppose that every one has made the acquaintance of the subject of this little biography at some time or other though to others he may not have appeared as he has appeared to me and as i know he has been called by many names indeed when i consider that there have been men and women who have sought his society with a passionate eagerness it is clear to me that his disguises must be extremely subtle and that he employs them with a just regard for the personalities of his companions for while some have found in his society the ultimate splendor of life for me he has always been wearisome and ridiculously mean of course it may be that i have known him too long for even as a child i was accustomed to find him at my side an unwelcome guest who came and went by no law that my youthful mind could determine certainly in those days he was more capricious and the method of argument by repetition which he still employs was only too well calculated to weary and distress a child but for the rest the herald whom i knew then was materially the herald whom i know now conceive a small man so severely afflicted with st vitus's dance that his features are hardly definable endow him with a fondness for clothes of dull colours grievously decorated with spots and a habit of asking meaningless questions over and over again in an utterly unemotional voice and you will be able to form a not unfair estimate of the joys of harold's society there have been exceptions however to the detestable colourlessness of harold's appearance i have seen him on occasion dressed in flaming red like mephistopheles and his shrill staccato voice has pierced my head like a corkscrew but these manifestations have always been brief and might even be considered enjoyable when compared with the unrestful monotony of Harold's society in general. Who taught me to call him by the noble name of Harold I do not know, but in my youthful days the man's character was oddly associated with the idea of virtue as expounded in the books I read on Sunday afternoons. That I hated him was, I felt, merely a fitting attribute in one whose instincts were admittedly bad but i did not allow the consideration to affect my rejoicings when i escaped from his company curiously too i perceived that the olympians were with me in this and since the moral soundness of those improving books was beyond question i had grave doubts as to their ultimate welfare but it was always an easy task to detect the olympians tripping in their own moralities they had so many as time went on and i grew out of the sunday books and all that they stood for I came to believe that I was growing out of Harold, too. His appearances became rare, and from his point of view a little ineffective. It pleased me to consider with a schoolboy's arrogance that he was little more than a child's nightmare, and that if a man turned to fight him, Harold would vanish. For a while Harold and his cunning played up to this idea. He would seek my side timidly and fly at a word. The long, sleepless nights of childhood and the weary days were forgotten and I made of him a jest. Sometimes I wondered whether he really existed, and then he came. At first I was only mildly astonished when I found that nothing I could say would make him leave me, but as the hours passed the old hatred asserted itself, and to fight the little man with the dull voice and the cruel spots on his clothes seemed all that there was in life to do. The hours passed into days and nights, and sometimes I was passive in the hopes that he might weary, sometimes i shouted answers to his questions the same answer to the same question over and over again i felt too that if i could only see his features plainly for a moment he would disappear and i would stare at him until the sky grew red as my eyes but i could not see him clearly and the world became a thing of dull colours terrible with spots by now i was fighting him with a sense of my own fatuity for I felt that nothing would make this man fight fairly. His voice had followed to a passionless whisper, and the spots on his clothes swelled into obscene blotches and burst like overripe fruit. It was then that the chloroform clutched me by the throat. I had never known anything on earth more sweet. Since then, it seems to me, Harold has never been quite the same. 
He comes to see me now and again, and sometimes even he lingers by my side. But there is a note of doubt about him that I do not remember to have noticed before. Some of his former spirit would seem to be lacking, and I am forced to wonder sometimes whether Harold is not aging. And though it may appear strange, the thought inspires me with a certain regret. I do not like the man, and I should be mad to seek him of my own accord. But in fairness I must acknowledge that in a negative way he has contributed to all the pleasures I have enjoyed. Sunsets and roses, and the white light of the stars. I owe my appreciation of them all to Harold, and I know that it is by aid of his keen realism that I have founded the city of my dreams. It will be a grey world when Harold is no more. End of section 14 Recording by Philip Gould